Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramph, ushering you into the weekend. It is November 10th, 2023. Um, the backdrop I have chosen today is Death Valley. Uh, we've had a lot of rain, especially uh, Hurricane Hillary uh, that washed through uh, California, not to mention we saw some of that rain happen here in Missoula, uh, some of the outskirts of some of the weather patterns. But this is basically a lot of the rain that fell. Um, I, I picked this picture up sometime this week and so some of the reservoir some of the extra water that has fallen into just this last year or so uh, basically made a uh, placid lake effect to the area over here so you can kind of see how it reflects well you know it's always a rare treat to see uh, rain or any kind of precipitation in, in Death Valley especially in uh, in a way where it goes upon the salt flats so it's always uh, interesting to kind of see that stuff like that. But as we get deeper and deeper into this conflict in Gaza, Friday saw U.S. Uh, Secretary Anthony, oh, uh, so uh, Anthony Blinken talked to IDF and officials from Israel, and there's a lot of back and forth and a big uh, push for uh, Americans to uh, seem like they're just like, hey, Israel, please stop doing this. And they're just like, no, we're, we've got to do this. If we don't stop them right now, they're never going to stop. And so after surrounding Gaza City and a couple of firefights as Israel security forces become an occupy, uh, occupying militia, uh, a chance for regular blocks of time for Palestinians to leave. But however, this morning uh, saw an increase in firefights in and around the hospital, saw over 80,000 people who were sheltered in the hospital of Shifa Hospital. Um, uh, basically flee to the south. Um, early Friday, Israel struck a courtyard and uh, um, department of Shifa Hospital where tens of thousands of people are sheltering, according to uh, Akirda, a spokesperson for the health ministry of Hamas or in Gaza. A video at the scene recorded the sound of incoming fire waking people up in their makeshift shelters in the courtyard, followed by screams for an ambulance. Death toll of civilians have uh, past 11,000 people, uh, with 4,300 of which were children, according to the Gaza Health Ministry as of today. Channel 4 was able to get some footage Wednesday from the northern part showing people walking south and some men being stripped down with, and zip-tied as they were uh, seemingly suspicious. Uh, news outlets have uh, had a chance to go inside Gaza with the IDF as they took control of Gaza City Wednesday. Uh, Geneva, the UN human rights chief, said that collective punishment by Israel of Palestine citizens and their forced evacuation as well as atrocities committed by Palestine's armed group on October 7th and their continued holding of hostages amount to war crimes. Uh, for the sake of the state of Israel, one thing you also have to know is that there's only one state of Israel which is controlled by Jewish-run state. Um, they are also surrounded by 22 uh, Arab states in the region as well. So if you really think about it in terms of the optics, there's only one Jewish state and there's 22 Arab states. So the Jewish people have a total population of 14 million uh, in the world. So that's 0.2% of the world population, half of which let live in Israel. Many don't even realize that Israel is not just for Jewish folks, but also they have a growing number of Christian uh, families and groups moving there as well, along with people who are uh, of the Muslim faith, which Acu uh, uh, accumulate to 1.7 million people, which is nearly 20% of the population of Israel. So one of the things that also major U.S. news coming out of the federal government, um, so that's kind of what's happening with there. Um, we're going to jump back to uh, some national news here as, you know, the, you know, as I'm talking right now, it could literally be changing what's happening in the, in the region as well. So um, in the U.S., uh, they're uh, thinking about renaming over 80 species of birds with names that would be considered uh, that w the, the, from names that would be considered harmful to history will be printed and reprinted in those names from Confederate Army generals. John P. McCown, uh, thick build to the thick build longspur. Okay, so so far the bird watchers have debated back and forth about the correct names with the l logical approach of habitat and appearance being the backbone of renaming 80 of those birds. This was a part of a bird watching group called Bird Names for Birds. My, my suggestion is to call all crows Russell. Uh, another big move for the feds is right to turn right on red lights. And so there's, there's, a, there's a couple places, especially Washington, D.C., that had a ban on turning uh, right on red, especially if the coast is clear. A dramatic rise in accidents or killings or injuries, pedestrians and bicyclists has led to a myriad of policies and infrastructure changes, but moves to ban right on red have drawn some of the most intense sentiments on both sides. 
for one, cyclists coming out of your blind spot as you're making your right turn is another issue, uh, even in a green light that may see your car competing for the right turn. But when you are stopped, it's easy to stare at oncoming traffic rather than the bike pad on your right. So if you're at a red light and you have to stop anyways, and you're not allowed to turn right on red, you just kind of wait for the uh, light to turn green, so you're a little bit more aware of your surroundings. But if uh, I can see how uh, log logically uh, people would turn right on red and they don't know if uh, a bike might just uh, be in that typical area. So signs in towns, also in Missoula, have a no right on red in some of the malfunction junctions, some bike lanes, especially if you're going across the, uh, uh, the Bitterroot trails. Uh, most bikes I've seen uh, turn into the bike lanes of oncoming traffic and a lot of them turn wide because a lot of them just cannot lose their momentum. Some bikers don't like going uh, into full stops and just kind of sway. Uh, if a cyclist can avoid putting their feet on the ground, then they will. Of course, the crash study in most states mentions about one to two bike ped deaths a year based on the right on red, but have disputes and uh, logically it should be safe regardless because one death could be too much. But if there is a trend, you got to do something. Um, New York City is a prime example of bustling city banning all right turns on red lights. Another item brought up by the concept of Idaho stop, making cyclists stop at red lights every time and, and only go when the coast is clear, which includes uh, them going through the intersection no matter the direction. But of course, I, um, th I don't ex expect Idaho to have too, too much congestion when it comes to uh, all that kind of stuff. So uh, as we go back into more Montana news, we find that our own Senator Steve Dames helped draft a bill for a cannabis business to bank directly instead of cash only because marijuana is not federal businesses and a lot of banks are federal and so therefore you can't necessarily uh, trade in commerce with the cannabis business not being federally recognized. So most states have legalized recreational marijuana including the entire American West outside of Utah, Idaho, and Wyoming. Montana voters made it legal in 2020 and the industry has grown in that short of time to tens of millions of dollars. However, banks only deal in cash only. Uh, our Senator Steve Dane said that it that the Safer Banking Act would help address that. If adopted, it would re represent a milestone in legislation offering protection to financial institutions that serve state-sanctioned pot businesses. Not to mention, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting kind of a turn of things, how like when the a uh, lot of uh, Republicans, and especially in Montana, were kind of swaying towards kind of going against the legalization of marijuana. Medical use was kind of okay for the longest time in Montana, but as soon as they got more recreational marijuana, they saw a lot of that tax revenue come in there, just like, hmm, money. Uh, speaking of legislation, uh, Idaho also decided to make, uh, oh, Ohio uh, decided to make recreational ca cannabis legal and also abortion. As elections across the U.S. wrapped, many Democrats have had a lot of wins in and around uh, Virginia, turning the tide in many places as well. Missoula had their own elections, which saw uh, Andrea Davis take the seat as the newest mayor of the city of Missoula for the uh, year of 2024. She'll be hosting this uh, duty for two years before the next election. This is a, a continuance of John Angan's election after he had his untimely death. Uh, defeating current city council member Mike Nugent and Andrea Davis has a background in affordable housing along with running Homeward as executive director. Homeward has been instrumental in offering programs for first time uh, home buying grants, financial fitness classes, along with managing various affordable housing complexes throughout the city of Missoula. Davis secured 14,000 votes to Mike's 9,000, earning her roughly 59% of the vote of nearly 56,000 registered voters, 25,000 people actually voted. Many of the incumbents held on their seats with Sandra Vasica, Ward 6 going on to a recount. And I looked up this morning and the no, no news, but of course, Bradley Seaman, the uh, uh, chief administrator for the elections office for the city of Missoula says they, we've received 12 rejected ballots floating around Ward 6. Um, the Missoula County Administration also said any rejected bills that get resolved by 5 p.m. get added to the totals this Monday. So, uh, and it was a close election. Uh, Sandra is ahead by five votes, and those 12 votes can be the decider when they get them resolved, and they have until Monday at 5 p.m. So what the election office does is they call the people who have cast their vote to make sure that, you know, who they voted for and all that kind of stuff to do all that stuff. And a lot of times rejected votes is when they don't fill in the bubble all the way and they have to uh, go back to it. So Missoula City County officials invited reporters and MCAT alike to take a tour of the new city council chambers, which is also in conjunction with the county of Missoula. And so this is going to be uh, renamed uh, 
John Engen Government Center, and so it's named after our former mayor, John Engen, who uh, had uh, 17 years as mayor of the city of Missoula, one of the longest terms ever for the city of Missoula. The city got a steal in getting this new facility when they bought it for nothing, uh, and they were acquired it from the federal government with help from Steve, uh, well, not, 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 um, from uh, John Tester, senator from the state of Montana. Uh, uh, the multi-million dollar project is, is to restore of the existing building and a partnership with the county to have a central location for all your government needs. Both sides plan to spend upwards of $17 million, which is roughly $9 million each, uh, to be able to get a uh, move-in ready and plenty of grants to get the place cleaned up through the brownfield sites. And since, you know, any building that was built before the 1980s pretty much has asbestos in the building, um, and this building was built in 1913 with plenty of renovations over the year on top of the annex building that was built, and it used to be part of the forestry department. And so those are some of the background stuff. So, so I'm not gonna show uh, more of those Saturday kids in these promos, but I actually have footage from inside the new, uh, uh, the potentially new, uh, government building. So without further ado, here is the clip and when I come back we're going to talk about some movies. And I remember thinking, looking out over this community at all of these places where, where Mayor Ingen had his, his fingerprints on our town. All of the ways in which he made our community a better place. All of the ways in which um, he lifted up and celebrated our community. Uh, and I knew in that moment that, um, that we were losing our friend, but our community would always have a friend in John Engen through the legacy that he, le that he left us. And whereas Mayor Engen believed that a strong and collaborative relationship between the leaders of Missoula County and the city of Missoula is, a, is of great public benefit, and whereas Mayor Engen and the Board of County Commissioners saw the value, utility, and beauty of revitalizing the historic federal building and worked for a decade to save and repurpose it for public use. And whereas Mayor Engen was grateful for the equally persistent efforts of his friend and colleague, Senator John Tester, in the transfer of the building to Missoula local governments. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, Missoula Mayor Jordan Hess and Missoula County Commissioners Josh Slotnick, Juanita Barrow, and David Strohmeyer, hereby do proclaim that the name of the Missoula Federal Building shall from this day forward be the, local, the John Engen Local Government Building. He believed that if we worked together, we would have the wherewithal to navigate complexity and ambiguity and uncertain funding situations and whatever all else would come our way and we would end up with things like a municipally owned water system or a reformed local government or a park system that's the envy of anyone everywhere. So with all of that, it makes tons of sense that his name the transition of this beautiful and well-built <coughs> government building, which has essentially been vacant for 10 years, is a huge victory for all of us. We are delighted and grateful that it will be known as the John Ingen Local Government Building. I am certain he is celebrating with us today, and his contributions will ev forever be rooted in this extraordinary place that now bears his name. All right. All right. All right. Everybody ready? Yes. Yeah. Do we look okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do we look okay? <laughs> <laughs> Three, two, one, cheese. 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 Come on, people. <laughs> Come on. One more. Come on, John. Cheese again. Cheese! <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks, everybody. All right, we are back. Let's talk about some crappy movies coming out this crappy weekend. <laughs> we got the marvelous Miss Marvels in these movies about things and space stuff happening. We have yet another Marvel movie starring Brie Larson and the other two from streaming shows. I'm sure you've watched it at home. 
I enjoyed these three gal pals on a journey across the universe with Nick Fury fresh off his own streaming show that people want to forget. I assume the big bad has some kind of power nullifier which results in the plot getting to things before they lose their powers for good. All right, moving on. Uh, then we got the holdovers. You like those Harold and Ma kind of type dark comedies that are more spiritual than comedy, kind of have you question bigger ideals and kind of stuff. From the creator of the Sideways movies, we get three people who are alone for the holidays, try to get out and enjoy the outdoors in this freezing college town in like Princeton or whatever. Enjoy tropes like, I've never thought of it that way, or I thought I wanted to be alone, but now I have found my family. It's basically uh, those kind of things for a cynical world to enjoy a found family trope. Then we have Manodrome. Brrr. Are you a man? Do you want to be a man? Man, yeah! This movie is more or less than a disaffected man joining a man's group to be a man. From the perspective of a weak man, only Jesse Eisenberg can play since he did the Facebook movie. He can't, can't seem to kind of catch a break in a serious movie. Enjoy this potentially good but probably bad character study about a weak man seeking other men to learn how to step up to be a man. Did I mention man was in the title? Go patriarchy. Um, and then we have a series of other movies that are happening like that. And so, uh, Journey to Bethlehem. Uh, an excuse for people who, with the problematic type of Christian upbringing to go to a movie theater where all the people learn to be heathens, but enjoy Jesus being born again. Uh, then we have A Wonderful Knife. If you liked dumb horror movies like Truth or Dare or Freaky Friday, but with a slasher, this is kind of like Final Girl wishing she was never born only to have the slasher still around. So the whole idea of this is like, I wish I was never born. It's like, wait a minute, but you saved a lot of people's lives and now... A whole, yeah, so it's a, it's a wonderful life, but with a serial killer. Then we have Your Lucky Day. Imagine turning, trying to your turn at a well-earned lottery ticket only to get involved with a hostage situation inside a store yeah, that you bought the darn thing. I, is it really worth $156 million? Probably. And so those are your movies that are coming out this weekend. I have a new dub and stuff for you guys. I'm trying to do a lot more of those old, sky, old school movies that are in color rather than just pure black and white like I've always done. So without further ado, here is uh, The Invincible Gladiator from 1962. Hmm. So, Sire... What do these people do to deserve to be burned at the stake? Well, they uh, brought their dog inside. They said it was a service dog, but it was an emotional support dog, which aren't the same thing. I might have went far in a few places, but, you know, I have to cover for myself, too, you know. This is not what I meant by sauna. Oh, God, it burns. Oh, why are you just... This is not what I meant by a just punishment. Oh, hey. <laughs> I see someone didn't skip leg day. <laughs> What's going on? I haven't seen you in a million years. I am years. very angry right now, and I need to yell at you for a second. Do you mind? Uh, uh, hey, why you took a turn? Why are you yelling at me? Hold on, I gotta sit down. I'm not used to these bursts of anger. Okay. So, yeah, I'm burning some people. What's the big deal? There were tourists under my care. Well, how come it's my fault that tourists break our laws in our country that was established thousands of years ago? What do you have to say about that, chief? Well, they come from a more advanced civilization, Am so I supposed that means... to bend over to the iPhone? The emissary is here. Sir, you're burning some of our people's bodies. Do you really think you can get away with it? So I must humbly request that you stop killing our people. They were here as emissaries for improving trade agreements for the both of us. So please, let them go. I plead to you. Well, the executioners get pretty restless if there's no one to kill. It's kind of hard to stop when they start it. Please, stop this. Our countries have seen so much bloodshed. You don't get to tell me what to do. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what is he doing? I, I don't know. I, I, I can I, do what I want, and this is what I'm doing. Tell your people in your country that your people have died of a severe sunburn because they did not bring sunscreen to our country. Huh. It's very sunny here. My people would not believe that for a second. Oh, trying to strong arm me, are ya? You want something from me? Hmm? You want our pogs? We do not need anything that's from the 90s. Oh, are you sure? Because we got a pretty nice collection. No, I don't think then so. Then we got nothing more to discuss. This will not end well, your highness. I have never lost a one-on-one -on -one pog match. I will take my leave. Ah, I'm sorry you had to see that. Party foul, no big deal. Not everyone understands pog. Wait, what's wrong? You doing okay? You dress me up in this little tunic and expect me to dance? You say, seize them, or seize them, but what about seize me? Do you seize me? People who ask to get seized don't get seized. You don't deserve to How get seized. How can anyone live like this? By praising me. Oh, is that it? People just have to agree with everything that you have to say 
<clears throat> hmm, I wouldn't worry about him. It is a waning crescent moon tonight. Whoa, whoa. That guy got really nice calves. Don't want to mess with him. Hmm. This is all going according to plan. A plan that I'll think about later. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back. Let's jump right into your city council. Uh, city council, uh, a lot of things happening. Monday's meeting was very short, but it was also a final push for the election on Monday, which you probably already know what happened, uh, as I told you. Uh, public comment, not about voting, but more on the lines of homelessness and the camping ordinance that the city has been trying to push. Uh, Tirza Azbel, uh, Ward 2 representative, talks about the outdoor camping ordinance. Over the summer, we've been holding community events to help facilitate conversations about the challenges of housing security Missoula faces. We became aware of an ordinance that would eliminate spaces where folks can shelter outside. As a result, we had an action night and collected these comments from concerned neighbors and impacted folks. I would like to submit 19 cards to the council to show that Missoula is a community that deeply cares about its most vulnerable. I urge the council to stop this ordinance that would effectively criminalize sheltering outside and instead invest in solutions that house our community. Thank you. All right. And so just to kind of like uh, talk on top of that too as well, like Chicago also had a, another city council meeting that uh, referred to uh, um, converting one of their uh, um, parks into a, um, uh, a, a tent kind of village kind of place in which a lot of the community said no to. Um, there was a lot of, uh, there was a consent agendas, items that reflected the accounts and one about the Johnson Street Shelter Public Forum. The city decided to address this sooner in terms of zoning and building codes and suspend some of the rules to operate a shelter 300 feet from residential storage, lockers with a minimum of nine cubic feet of space and other to have to do with the building structure and landscaping, which they will not do. This is a, basically a public hearing set for Monday. However, much discussion around this topic as Mayor Jordan Hess talks about the proclamation declaring the new city county building as the John Angan government building in his honor. And so this is what um, uh, Mayor uh, Jordan Hess had to say. I want to thank all of the staff at the city and county uh, who've been working on this project. I want to thank Senator Tester uh, and the staff at the General Services Administration within the federal government. Um, and all of the folks that have gotten us to this point. There's a lot of exciting work underway at that building and um, a lot of nice uh, memories and nice words said today uh, in a ceremony that, that's um, televised and, and available. Um, and I want to thank all the council members who came to that ceremony. Um, uh, and just um, want to continue to, I want to enter into the record one more time my gratitude for um, Mayor Engen and what he did for our community over many decades of public service and uh, the um, personal mentor that he was for me. Yep. And so that was that, uh, that uh, and um, Jordan Hess would, uh, would not be able to, uh, and in many ways, Jordan Hess will never be able to uh, um, be in a government position as soon as the uh, new government building opens. Heck, even Andrea Davis might not even be able to uh, um, uh, hit the gavel um, in the uh, new uh, city county building that's named after the John a uh, named for John Ingen government building. So Go John Ingen government centers, excuse me. Other than that, there was further discussion on rezoning near Mullen area neighborhood being built. This has been a topic for the city for a while now, and I didn't want to bore you with too many of the details, but the whole point of this was that neighborhoods that are typically single family houses as they transition into more duplexes and high multi-dwelling units with apartments while not messing with the aesthetic of the neighborhood. That was part of the zoning and compromises that they made during that part of it. There wasn't really much to add to it because it was a lot of the same thing showing the plans for the neighborhood. The City of Missoula City Council reflects on the international problem facing local towns. Um, Gwen Jones talks, uh, City Council talks about the Sunday Vigil at the University of Montana. So this is back to the Israeli-Hamas war. And I just wanted to first of all note that there were messages and prayers that I thought were touching and thoughtful and all of them calling for resolution in some form or fashion and for peace. Um, I think the current conflict in the Middle East is just brutal 
it has the potential to get much worse. And calling for peace really resonated, I think, with everyone in the room. And I do think it impacts us here in Missoula. Um, there have been some peaceful demonstrations on all sides of the issue. Um, there have also been some white supremacists who have come to demonstrate in Missoula. And I just wanted to call out that I think their message often is grounded in hate speech. And I don't think hate speech has a place in Missoula. Yep. And so uh, we also had a quote from Daniel Colino talking about uh, the uh, citizens of Palestine. Um, I went to a, a protest this weekend in town where we all marched over to John Tester, our senator's office, and asked him to um, call for a, a ceasefire and uh, stop using our taxpayer money to uh, bomb children in Palestine. And um, there was about 200 of us that went to his office to, to demand a, a ceasefire and to stop using our tax money to um, to bomb innocent children, and um, I just think it's important that we all do what we can with our power to to speak up and ask our representatives, um, especially the ones that that would know better, to stop using our tax money to um, to kill innocent people overseas in Palestine. And um, if John Tester's staff is listening, I would ask you all to encourage him to join the other members of Congress who are ca calling for peace and calling for a ceasefire. And I asked John Tester to stop voting to use our tax money to uh, bomb innocent children. Okay. All right. So that was that part of the uh, Monday night's meeting. There wasn't really much going on in terms of uh, like procedural type stuff, but we're going to jump right into more committee meeting stuff as we look into public safety and health, which is an interesting because the city is looking to use grants to expand the CIT, which is the crisis intervention team, part of the crisis mobile crisis unit, which aims to get federal U.S. dollars, uh, U.S. Department of Justice grant money for the purpose of behavioral health. This would be uh, half a million dollars awarded the city of Missoula for this. Uh, before here, before that, here are some of the informative clips and info about the CIT. Uh, Teresa Williams, Missoula County CIT Program Manager, talks a little bit more about this program. This, um, but our behavioral health system is in crisis. This little picture here demonstrates how messy it is. And I will note that our, our system has never not been in crisis. Um, and so you can see we've got 988, um, where will they send me? 911, who will they send? Law enforcement, will they be trained? Um, emergency medical services, what can they do? Um, this dysfunctional system affects our neighbors with and without safe and stable housing. And we also have here, too, a crisis is more than a moment. Um, it is comprised of early intervention, response, stabilization, prevention. And if you think about that in um, kind of like a, um, a cycle, in between there is a thread of transition support services. And those are so key. And I'll talk about that shortly um, in relation to this grant. Um, so this dysfunctional system uh, perpetuates inequity and injustice, particularly for individuals in communities that we know experience disproportionate health outcomes, uh, Alaskan Indian or Alaska Native, American Indian, and people of color. Um, so it's really important that you guys can see um, where we are. And uh, mental illness is a big one as well. And as many people uh, that I've known who've been in uh, the system uh, time and time again, um, even the uh, one in the local mental health facility that used to be um, off of, um, I want to say, Russell Street, a couple of people that I know uh, hated that site because they didn't treat a lot of people with respect. The crisis administration team dealt with a higher need for follow-ups for a mental health crisis calls, creating an uh, appropriate response, but 911 is always the main number. All, they want people to call regardless of the mental, the level of mental health crisis. 988, the suicide hotline, is preventative care, while 911 is for folks worried about people who are in crisis. Uh, but also, they offer the softer touch, which is what part of this mobile crisis unit is for. Um, however, if a person is a danger to themselves or others, this could complicate things since the situation has to be handled before the individual's needs can be taken care of in terms of their well mental well-being. Teresa talks a little bit more about the process of using this money. Um, this is what she had to say. We selected our target population for this grant based on um, data that we had within our, our program on folks that were being referred to our stakeholder meetings. And what we noticed was um, that there was a disproportionate 
uh, number of folks of genders and races that are more likely to become involved in the criminal justice system, which are females, transgender female, gender nonconforming, American Indian, Alaska Native or Indigenous, Black, African American or African, and Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. Um, so that is really like the target of this of this grant. Um, the CIT model adds so much infrastructure to this grant already. And then um, we recently had a sequential intercept mapping workshop, and this was priority number one um, that we wanted to work on on this grant. So the activities we want to hire a project specialist to help us carry out all these activities. Um, creating new world data fields. So right now, our first responders, when they close a call, um, the city of Missoula Police Department, for example, will use a MH1 code, but that's not universal, and MH stands for mental health one. Um, we want to be able to universalize that each first responder has to flag the call, either behavior health, substance use, houselessness, or all, or none. And then we want to hire a care traffic controller through all nations who may um, have a tie to being housed in the new housing navigation center um, to take those referrals and try to match those folks to services and that's that all right so that was the big push for it as well as wayfinding like you you can easily just mitigate a situation simply doing the a wellness check isn't enough to help those who would be frequently using 911 services shouldn't be the only option for people at CIT if you go through the city's website the main focus of a CIT is jail diversion, case management, and suicide assessment. Uh, Mary Parrish, CIT research and evaluation uh, analyst, uh, talks about community partnerships because you can't just do this alone. One of the things that's really pretty cool about the model is that it is a community health framework. And when I say that, community health is with community. It's not to, at, or for. So we always are trying to gather community input. And so, we are currently working um, through a really kind of magical Missoula connection from Mr. Eric Hallstrom. We were connected with graduate students from the University of Minnesota in the School of Public Affairs who wanted to conduct an evaluation project. And so they connected with us here in Missoula in our CIT program. And we are now at the phase of the game where they're implementing the evaluation and we are reaching out across the community to professionals and the public alike to ask them what is their ideal version of a behavioral health crisis response system. All right, and so, you know, it's, it's interesting to kind of look at this because there are um, unintended consequences of this thing that I'm really thinking about as they're talking about this. And the idea that, hey, you know, crisis prevention, that kind of thing, is you're preventing somebody from doing something they haven't done. And that in ways is like, what gives people the right to take some certain liberties away from people who haven't done anything? And unfortunately, our legal system is very reactionary. And it's always like justice is always comes at a later time. And even when it comes to some mental health, it's like, oh, my person, this person is going through some mental health crises. And so they wanted to create this as a pathway, as a means to n not only do a wellness check, because you know a lot of times the police would kind of take up those roles of being like, oh, there was a crisis at this one place, maybe some form of domestic violence and you know the police officer come goes back to do, do a double check and usually once and then they just kind of go on and do keep on doing their own other stuff and then with this crisis intervention team um, they also did some more research and especially during the pandemic with a lot of people stuck indoors and everything like that um, the the mobile crisis unit um, one of their biggest issues was they couldn't operate 24 7 they still can't operate 24 7 but the big thing that they took away from it was the uptick in calls for uh, care use, not to mention they, you know, people just wanted someone to talk to, um, someone here locally, because a lot of times it can be kind of discouraging to talk to somebody who is from another place, another state, or heck, even potentially another country, vol volunteering to be on the suicide hotline, which is 988. Also, they'll be uh, appointing a new city cl uh, clerk, which is also a big deal because Marty Rabine, who has been working on this job since the 90s and lived through quite a few mayors besides John Yane, who uh, served for 17 years, uh, Claire Trimble will be voted in on Monday and go into effect on January 1st, 2024. Um, up next, the city uh, and the county talked about the green initiatives. Um, the county, I didn't see the county there in this particular meeting, but this was a presentation. And the set date is December 11th. This is a major move th to get the contract with North Surface Energy to improve green energy initiatives. Uh, Caroline Lauer uh, with uh, Climate Start Missoula talks about green tariffs. And this is what she had to say. 
Shortly after, in December of 2019, the Public Service Commission directed Northwestern Energy to explore a green tariff. As Avora said, this is another name for the Green Power Program. But there was a directive to and do a stakeholder engagement process to see what would a green tariff program look like in Montana. And that really opened the door for us in a much more concrete way to come to the table with Northwestern Energy and begin negotiating for a big, uh, to get us a big chunk of the way towards our 100% goal. So in June of 2020, we memorialized this relationship with an MOU with Northwestern Energy. And then a few months later, um, in February of 2021, we signed an interlocal between uh, the city of Missoula, Missoula County, and then the cities of Bozeman and Helena to hire a consultant to explore the green tariff more. And just, you know, as you see from the, uh, um, the, the scale, like with all the times, there's a there's a pretty wide gap between 2021 because it seemed like there's good momentum going on here even well through the pandemic um going into these kind of things but it's it's very interesting and um when it comes to those cli these climate things it's, 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 it's so it's always been kind of i hate to say this but discouraging um and just in terms of just like it feels like they just keep on kicking the can down the road but this program hopefully will uh, create more of a uh with the tariffs is that they would hold uh, the folks more accountable especially north Coast energy to move forward with this kind of the and also incentivize more green energy within their own business along with that so green tariffs are voluntary unit uh, uh utility programs that allow eligible customers to both buy the energy and associated re renewable energy uh, cert certificates, RECs, from large-scale renewable energy projects through an independent tariff or as a rider on a customer's current electricity bill. So Caroline um, also talks about how you can get involved with this voluntary program and a little bit of background on this. We want to make sure that this represents a good economic proposition for those who are participating, that it won't lead to bill increases, to sizable bill increases or anything like that. So we've spent a great deal of time negotiating on how the program rate will be designed. And to make it as simple as possible for now, it is essentially the fixed cost of building, operating, and maintaining this new resource against a floating credit. And that floating credit will be based on the market value of the electricity produced. So fixed cost against a floating credit will equal a subscription rate. And early modeling indicates a modest premium with the potential for a bill credit. And when I say modest, we're talking in the one to two percent range. All right. So, yeah. And that's kind of like the last quote I have from this particular part of this meeting. This is more part of the conservation and uh, uh, parks. As you can see, uh, uh, much of the elect uh, electrical infrastructure in the United States is multiple states aside from places like Texas who have their own grid. This would uh, effectively open the door for power programs to translate to places that don't get as much uh, sun, such as Arizona. Uh, the main goal is to, for the Public Service Commission to draft a policy to make a commitment to green energy in terms of financial obligations and joint filings with Northwestern Energy. And right now it's all about planning. And if everything goes fine, the proposed list to the PSC by early to mid 2024, this will get the ball rolling on green energy, followed by uh, the real projects in 2025 with bids and proposals related to green energy. We'll see how this works out since it's all about creating the contract. This will be ongoing. Uh, as per usual, we also have some uh, videos and pr uh, uh, stuff to kind of promote. Uh, these are a lot of the programs that are airing on, uh, on MCAT and also on our YouTube page uh, that you can watch right now. And so when we think about intersectionality, especially in, in the indigenous community, we all sort of have a baseline understanding, especially in intentional laws put in by the federal government, of why we come in with so much trauma. So we sort of have the, the community, the family-based trauma, um, then you move on to the sort of the micro level, the personal trauma of, I was raised with an abusive family, I was in the foster system, I was taken away from my family, I never got to be engaged in my culture, which is a very specific um, native concern and intersectionality. 
just because you want an Indian on your board or you want an Indian teacher or you want an Indian book reviewer doesn't mean you're going to find one. Doesn't mean there's a bunch of people just jumping for that opportunity because we've never had the opportunity to really learn to be these things the way more privileged people have. So like everything else, it's an incredibly long game to decide we're going to provide opportunity and not, I, I, I think we need to provide these opportunities to everybody who doesn't have one. Indians are just part of it. That's the, we're all in this together. That's the, the, we have to reconcile with everything that's brought us up to this point, admit that it happened, agree that it's never going to happen again, and then move forward in this more unified togetherness family. And all the staff here at Willard wish the best for you as you go out into the world and continue to make the values and lessons learned here at Willard part of your legacy as you continue to braid the rope. Congratulations again to all of our graduates. Like mice. I totally didn't do it. Winter Blues got you down. MCAT is back once again with Winter Days. Stop motion, movie making, and more with a seasonal camp. Winter Days is three days of fun from December 27th to the 29th, starting at 10 a.m. Stay cool, Missoula. All right, we are back. We're doing one big final push to the end of the uh, episode of Wake Up Missoula. And we're going to talk about some things happening within the city of Missoula in terms of things to do. If you're interested in doing things and kind of stuff, today is uh, a day off for a lot of those school kids. And so MCT and many other uh, organizations are doing a, uh, a single day camp. MCT Center for Performing Arts School is out and it's time to play. MCT is excited to offer a long day theater camps on most Missoula County Public Schools, no school days. Students will rehearse and perform a small non-ticketed musical in just one day. Um, the uh, play starts at 9 a.m. and goes into about 5.45 with their uh, show. Um, registration is 65 bucks. Bitcoin Basic, Lifelong Learning Center for those who want to gamble on unregulated cryptocurrency, but the Lifelong Learning Center is a great organization that allows for people to teach and also learn in terms of uh, GED prep, GED programs, also get certification. It's basically like, like night school, but you can pick and choose classes and you can learn things and get certified in all sorts of things like uh, welding, uh, basic welding, just so you guys know. Uh, Holiday Market. Uh, is happening uh, today and tomorrow. This is at the Holy Spirit es uh, Escapal Church uh, Parish Hall where it will impress you with all the treasures. The Guild Room will delight you with all its teddy bear picnic, coffee and donuts available there too. Many of us say, well, we don't need a thing, but someone in your life does. And this year's holiday market gives you the perfect and easiest way to take care of the gift giving opportunities in your life. A lot of crafts are happening as well, including the Holiday Bazaar at St. Paul Lutheran Church, which will have handmade crafts, arts, pieces, and holiday de decor along with handmade candy, cookies, bread, jams, jellies, and relishes for sale. These are their gift baskets and treasures available for the silent auction. We'll probably have the uh, big uh, Missoula Giant Craft Fair at the Adam Center sometime soon. I haven't seen it uh, um, yet, but this weekend there's a lot of other things happening as well. Um, Montana Natural History Center is also doing a school out camp at 9.30 as the start time. This is for uh, first to third graders, and this is uh, these are the camps take place on MCPS conference or PIR days. So. Uh, that's what's happening there. And if you don't, if you don't have a chance to sign up your kid for a camp like that, but if you want them to uh, um, also uh, be active, but it's kind of cold out there. Um, indoor fun at Mismo Gymnastics, YMCA, and Roots Acker Sports Center. Those are the indoor uh, areas in which you can go to and have your kid be active while still being indoors. Lunch at the Missoula Senior Center. This is an ongoing event on weekdays, 11:30 a.m. at the Missoula Senior Center. Pickleball, they're doing a intro lesson and also lessons for beginners. Um, 12.45 is their introduction and 1.45 is a lesson for beginners. Um, Home Resource is also do a design to deconstruction, uh, sustainable uh, careers workshop. Um, and this is an evening of conversation and networking as they invite two industry experts to share their journeys. They're from Jen Clary, architect and owner of Encompass Design, who will 
talk about her career path in sustainable building design and why addressing in emissions in the built environment is crucial. Gary Delp, a co-owner of Heritage Timber, who will also talk about the careers in deconstruction and why reducing building waste matters and addressing the climate crisis free and open to the public, light snacks provided. Shane Coburn is going to be playing some folk music at Imagination Brewing Company start at 6 p.m. MSEF's -E annual snowball is going to be at the barn off of on Mullen Road. Uh, hate the pun, but the event that promotes uh, winter sports and, and rec as this annual fundraising event, which means eighty sixty dollar fees. This is a uh, this is a part of dinner auction and live music, and is to promote uh, the. Um, winter sports and rec in this annual fundraising event. Also, there's a comedian coming here to town, Carlos Mencia. Remember that guy from Comedy Central is Minded Mencia? And then he kind of got uh, basically reality checked by a bunch of other uh, comedians basically saying, hey, dude, stop stealing our jokes. And as a result, uh, Carlos Mencia kind of was a faded star. And he still does his thing. He still does his tours, still kind of does his things. You know, he's funny, don't get me wrong, but I just want to give you a little bit of brief history on Carlos Mencia. Uh, I really liked him back in the day, but I haven't heard too much from him lately. And an evening celebration of Montana laureate Chris Latre. Um, the Montana Museum Public Library is pleased to host an evening of, uh, in celebration of Frenchtown's Chris Latre, the newest Montana Poet Laureate. Mark Gibbons is no longer the Poet Laureate and uh, will end his term. Um, so the, uh, uh, he was appointed the, uh, poet, the state's 11th Poet Laureate on Oct August 1st, 2023. His term will last until same August 1st, two years later on 2025. And if you're interested in seeing the last Poet Laureate, Mark Gibbon has poets and poems read during his uh, Poets in Montana, which is currently airing on MCAT's YouTube channel um, and also uh, regular channel 189. You can check it out. on. Uh, they're all posted on our YouTube page, MCAT TV Missoula. And if you're interested in going to some uh, John Floridus, one of the indie local musicians here in town, Cranky Sam Public House is hosting him at 7 p.m. Folk Music uh, by Ten Cent Mule is going to be at the Old Post at 7 p.m. tonight. Uh, Monks is doing some DJ music through uh, Clay Secrets album release show. This is an 8 p.m. It's a late night kind of thing that goes until the a.m. Uh, Russ Nasset and the Revelators is a union club jam band starting at 9 p.m. It's a bar club. It's a, it's a nice, cool little bar. Um, Mets Light Charlie is going to be at the top out playing blues music. And then kicking off your Saturday, chess. Ooh. Why not wake up nice and early to play chess at 9 a.m.? Missoula's Chess Club hosts their 42nd annual chess tournament at a Holiday Inn in Missoula downtown. And it's going to happen from November 11th to the 12th. Scholastics and open divisions. See the website for more details. USCF membership required. November to remember craft fair. Missoula Senior Center is also doing their own craft fair, which they're going to be opening up their thrift shop in the basement with special deals. They do events like this. Orchard Homes 36th Annual Market and Craft Bazaar. So they're doing a two-day uh, Saturday and Sunday from 9 to 3 p.m. They have pies, honey, gifts, herbal teas, Mandela art, ornaments, crystal teas, uh, jewelry, salsa, sourdough, <laughs> uh, Christmas stockings, baby blankets, personal care items, salves, um, dog collars, soaps, lotions, breads, Scroll, saw art, tie dye, angel food cake, bowl, cozies, <laughs> salsa, decorative pens, stickers, fry bed, Christmas, table runners, uh, McCrane plants, uh, uh, travel pillows, etch gar, <laughs> all, yeah, um, etch grass. I'm going to say it all now. I I'm, not, I'm not finishing. Veggies, sock monkeys, and so much more. Uh, I think they pretty much covered everything that, that you'd probably see at this fair, uh, at, this, uh, at their uh, craft bazaar. The Perry Sisters Christmas Vintage Market, Missoula County Fairgrounds shop the best vintage and handmade uh, vendors in the area. Enjoy delicious food and beverage vendors. Find the perfect vintage or handmade items for your home or gift and support local businesses, owners, and Santa photos and face paintings for the kids. So that's starting at 10 a.m. on Saturday. So if you want to get those Christmas photos out, it's never too early to do it. Fix a clinic at Home Resource starting at 11 a.m. They uh, do these once in a while. They help people fix their uh, landscaping and light, constru light construction needs for home improvements. And it starts at 11 a.m. at the Home Resource. Can the Cats, this is a continuation leading up to the uh, Grizz Cat game. Food Bank benefits from this competition. Um, teen Open Studio, they're bringing this back at the Missoula Art Museum. Uh, to get teens interested in art, the Missoula Art Museum will open their doors to this event that encourages teens to use uh, True Blue Artist Studio space at the Missoula Art Museum. And this is at noon. And then, of course, as always, MCAT does our Saturday drop-ins every Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. Um, we had our 
today off and uh, we're going to be still open on Saturday for regular activities. Um, Leif Christensen is going to be performing at Cranky Sam Public House at 5.30 on Saturday night. Wolf in the Moons and Imagination Brewing Company um, is going to be playing some folk music starting at 6. Uh, Draftworks is going to be performing an indie band, uh, Andrew uh, Longator and uh, Brendan Nolan at Draftworks starting at 6 p.m. Uh, Small Claims Album Release Party is going to be at Free Cycles starting at 7 p.m. and they're a folk band. Uh, two Nights is going to be hosting John Florides at the Old Post. Um, um, sorry, John Florides is going to be at the Old Post at 7 p.m. I don't know why I wrote two, oh, I wrote two nights because he's performing tonight and tomorrow night. So anyways, um, Missoula Folklore Society Contra Dance um, is going to be um, 8 p.m. in the UC Ballroom. Solid Snake Karaoke at the West Side Lane starting at 9 p.m. Mudside Charlie is going to be at Union Club on uh, Saturday at 9 p.m. And then uh, wrapping things up is the Badlander, DJ Chris Moon, and North Folk Crossing at the Top Hout playing some bluegrass music. And of course, as we do get in the weekend, I wanted to mention MCAT did lose a member of its staff recently, Rick Phillips, who uh, did the la vast majority of city council meetings behind the scenes, uh, succumbed to his illness on October 31st. Rick was born April 5th, 1953 to Ida and Bob Phillips in Cut Bank, Montana. As a child, his family moved to Conrad, Montana. Rick attended the University of Montana for fine arts and had four boys from two marriages. Joel Baird, general manager of MCAT, was referred to, referred to him as a uh, brother uh, and had a close relationship since the 80s, since college. He was uh, uh, the go-to guy for archiving many of the resident artists of Missoula Art Museum, Missoula Montana Museum of Art and Culture, and various other museums that host the artists. Um, he had well over 300 paintings that were not publicly known, especially to me, and had no intention of releasing them because during his eulogy, his family and friends described his art as playing piano in the closet rather than let others take the joy of art from him. Um, I took out some of the swearing. Uh, so Rick is survived by his wife, Beth Cogswell, son, Yancey, Gavin, Finn, and Sam Phillips, and his brother, Gary Phillips. So we miss you, Rick. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Take care.